Thank you all for being here. And I'd also like to extend our sincere gratitude to Merck and acknowledgement for their support of this briefing. Today's meeting will be recorded. Please feel free to utilize the Q&A chat box for questions and we'll have the opportunity to answer questions and engage panelists at the end of the briefing. My name is Dr. Elena Efron from Healthy Women. I'm standing in for Beth Badalino, Healthy Women's CEO, as she had a conflict arise. It is my utmost pleasure to be your moderator today. Healthy Women is a leading national nonprofit organization dedicated to educating midlife women so they can make informed health decisions, advocate for themselves, and prioritize their health and wellness. As women, we're often the chief medical officers of our family, the caretakers, the decision makers across that intergenerational health span, and what is sometimes referred to as that sandwich generation. That is those taking care of kids while simultaneously taking care of parents, relatives, or older adults. And as such, there's just a lot to be responsible for and a lot that rests on our shoulders. Healthy Women supports women and this process by serving as a trusted resource and providing credible, evidence-based, up-to-date information relevant to health, well-being, and disease prevention that helps to foster informed, confident, and sound decision-making. And we believe preventive care is a critical aspect to that work. This briefing is proudly presented by Healthy Women and its amazing HPV coalition, which is a collaboration of over 30 health advocacy organizations who are coming together to build vaccine confidence, access, and utilization across the lifespan. And as such, to increase HPV vaccination uptake rate in order to prevent HPV-related cancers. Together, we're adding that collective strength of our voices to the advocacy initiatives with partners and stakeholders have been advancing over many years. And we want our voices to be heard and to be a resource for policymakers. What we're hoping to achieve here today is support for and greater awareness around effective and powerful prevention mechanisms, such as the HPV vaccine, to support an increase in HPV vaccination uptake rates for both females and males starting at age nine in order to prevent HPV-related cancers, access to vaccination, screening, and early intervention treatments, and how they can help end several cancers, improve, improve health outcomes, and advanced disease prevention efforts, and what actions can be taken by Congress to help achieve increased uptake of and access to these modalities throughout and across the nation. Our briefing will begin with remarks from three members of Congress who are co-sponsors of the Prevent HPV Cancers Act of 2023, and we want to share their thoughts on this important topic. We'll hear from the three main bipartisan co-sponsors of the bill, Congresswoman Kathy Castor of Florida, Congresswoman Julia Letlow of Louisiana, and Dr. Kim Schreier, Congresswoman from Washington. Welcome, Congresswomen. Sound. Hey, Aditya, if you can unmute, I think we're struggling yeah, there with our sound. Still over 37,000 cases of cancer caused by HPV diagnosed in the United States every year among men and women. The HPV vaccine has been available since 2006 one of only two cancer-preventing vaccines, and the only one that prevents six types of cancer, including cervical and throat cancer. But immunization rates for HPV are too low, especially when compared to other vaccines. And unfortunately, vaccine hesitancy and misinformation have grown since the pandemic. Uh, cancer screenings also have decreased, uh, leading to increases in late stage diagnosis uh, and more that are more difficult to treat and more likely to recur. Disparities in both vaccination and screening rates also remain a challenge. That's why I'm grateful to all of you that we can come together and we can reduce cancer cases and deaths. Here's how you can help. I introduced the Bipartisan Prevent HPV Cancers Act uh, with my colleagues, Congresswoman Kim Schreier of Washington and Julia Letlow of Louisiana. The bill will create a national public awareness campaign on HPV-related cancers, will highlight the importance of life-saving vaccines and cancer screenings. We want parents and pediatricians to protect boys and girls 
for my future cancer diagnosis and understand the best age to get vaccinated. The bill has a particular emphasis on equity and will boost resources uh, to decrease disparities in cancer deaths across the United States as well. Please encourage your member of Congress to co-sponsor the Prevent HPV Cancers Act. This year it's HR 3633. We'll boost vaccination rates and ensure that everyone understands the importance of cancer prevention and screening. So thank you for your help in standing up to cancer. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak at the Congressional Briefing on HPV-related cancers today. I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person, but I am so glad that I'm able to share my thoughts and work in Congress with you on such an important topic. I share the same goal that many of you do who are in attendance or tuned in today. And that is the goal of increasing awareness for HPV-related cancers and treatments. This is essential in protecting the health of our communities, especially in my home state of Louisiana, where cancer rates are especially high. While this issue hits close to home for my constituents, I have prioritized working with my colleagues across the aisle and co-introduced the bipartisan Prevent HPV Cancers Act, which stands for Promoting Resources to Expand Vaccination education, and new treatments for HPV cancers. HPV and HPV-related cancers don't receive enough attention, and oftentimes the topic makes people uncomfortable to discuss. It is important to remove the stigma and increase discussion around it so everyone has access to crucial information. We are using our voices in Congress to speak for women across the country and share information that can truly save lives. This act, would create a national campaign to educate providers, parents, and the public about the life-saving HPV vaccine. It would also boost resources for a federal initiative to provide access to timely cervical cancer screenings and diagnostic services for uninsured and underserved individuals. Early screenings are imperative. And by increasing public knowledge and increasing our nation's HPV vaccination rate, we can save tens of thousands of lives every year. By working together to address the barriers that currently exist, we can maximize the ability of this vaccine to protect communities and prevent unnecessary cancers and deaths. Together, we can ensure that patients have access to timely vaccinations and screenings, no matter their location or ability to pay out of pocket. Thank you again for taking the time to participate in today's briefing. I look forward to working with all of you on this very important issue. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining this briefing on the very important topic of preventing HPV-related cancers through vaccination and screening. I'm Representative Kim Schreier from Washington's 8th Congressional District, and I also have the honor of being the first pediatrician in Congress. As a pediatrician, a parent, and a member of Congress, I've worked to ensure that children have access to routine vaccinations and that life-saving vaccines are available to all populations. Immunizations are one of the greatest public health tools we have, and they work best when there's widespread use. Vaccinations have long been considered a necessity and routine care for newborns, children, aging adults, international travelers, and new parents. Vaccines are the safest way to prevent or even eradicate disease, avoid suffering, and protect our communities. From the polio vaccine to the measles and smallpox vaccines, widespread inoculation has saved lives for generations. However, despite generations of celebrating the opportunity to be vaccinated, I saw in my own practice a steady increase in vaccine hesitancy and even in some cases, outright refusal. Now, much of this began with fraudster Dr. Wakefield's 1998 claim that the MMR vaccine was a cause of autism, which understandably scared parents. He has since lost his medical license and has been completely discredited. Now, adding to that was an EPA assessment that the tiny amount of mercury used as an adjuvant to make vaccines more potent 
might be too high an exposure for a single shot of hepatitis B vaccine in a neonate, even though this was a one-time exposure to the less bioavailable form, and there was no medical concern outside of the EPA. Well, the impact on parents was undeniable, and suddenly risks seemed scarier than benefits, particularly to this new generation of parents who had no familiarity with the diseases these immunizations were preventing. In other words, the risk-benefit calculation was distorted. So vaccine hesitancy and outright refusal has markedly accelerated again since the politicization of and misinformation about the COVID vaccines. Under immunization was the basis for outbreaks of measles and polio previously eradicated in the U.S. And we were also seeing increased rates of morbidity and mortality from other vaccine preventable diseases. The growing wave of misinformation around vaccines has contributed to healthcare decision making based on unfounded fears and not on evidence based scientific facts. Furthermore, between November and December of 21, over 692,000 preventable hospitalizations occurred in unvaccinated individuals, costing the United States economy over 13.8 billion and costing many patients their lives. That's just a one month period. As a pediatrician, I noticed particularly strong opposition to the HPV vaccine. I found this so interesting because I've always said to others and to myself, wow, if only there were a vaccine that could prevent cancer. And now we had one and parents were rejecting it. One parental concern I heard was that it might encourage promiscuity since HPV is sexually transmitted. Another was, well, why does my child need this at age 11? Well, maybe because it's more effective, requires fewer doses, and then it removes your concern that it might encourage promiscuity. Another one was, well, why does my son need this vaccine meant to prevent cervical cancer? Then I needed to get into a discussion about oral cancers while not actually mentioning oral sex in front of an 11 year old. The vast majority of oral cancers today are caused by HPV, not smoking and incidence is on the rise. Now, one data point that I found incredibly interesting was that the biggest predictor of whether a tween received this vaccine was whether their healthcare provider encouraged it. That's why with my colleague, Representative Kathy Castor, I introduced the Promoting Resources to Expand Vaccination, Education, and New Treatments for HPV Cancers Act, or the Prevent HPV Cancers Act. This bill would help prevent cancer and save lives by raising awareness about HPV and HPV-related cancers through a national campaign to educate providers, parents, and the public about the life-saving HPV vaccine. It would also boost resources for a federal initiative to provide access to timely cervical cancer screening and diagnostic services for uninsured and underserved individuals. As you learn more during today's discussion about the ability to prevent cancer through the HPV vaccination and ways to increase vaccination uptake, I hope you will strongly consider supporting the Prevent HPV Cancers Act. I will work to continue legislative efforts around vaccine access and improving vaccine uptake. Human papillomavirus, HPV, causes six types of cancers, leading to nearly 36,000 cases of cancer each year in the United States. Together, we can ensure that patients have access to timely, life-saving vaccinations like the HPV vaccine, no matter their location or ability to pay. By working to address all of these barriers, we can educate the public, maximize vaccine uptake, protect communities, and avoid vaccine-preventable disease. Thank you again for having me today and for participating in today's briefing. I look forward to working together with you. Thank you, Representatives Castor, Letlow, and Schreier for giving us your thoughts on the importance of HPV vaccination and preventing HPV-related cancers. 
It is now my great honor to introduce our panel for today's briefing. Tamika Felder, founder and CEO of Survivor. Dr. Ko Sh uh, Shoba Kirshnan, founder and president of the Global Initiative Against HPV and Cervical Cancer, member of the Advocacy Campaign Committee with the International Papillomavirus Society, and board member with the American Medical Women's Association from 2019 to 2023. Jason Mendelson of Superman HPV, oral pharyngeal cancer survivor, and member of the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance Board of Directors. Dr. Heather Brandt, Director of the HPV Cancer Prevention Program and Co-Associate Director for Outreach at St. Jude Comprehensive Cancer Center, and Dr. Catherine Coonrod, Senior Advisor for the Cancer Moonshot Policy Coordination in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Again, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentations. And Tamika, the mic is yours. Hello, and thank you all for having me. I am so happy to be here and excited about the future and possibilities with this bill. Um, next slide, please. At 25 years old, I was living my life in Washington, DC, excited about my future as a television producer, and then the unthinkable happened. Next slide. I was diagnosed with stage 2B cervical cancer, and it was a journey. I had a radical hysterectomy followed by chemotherapy, radiation therapy, loss of fertility, and I live with secondary post-cancer issues. The latter I sometimes don't even want to bring up because I'm lucky that I survived. I made it. I lived past this disease that we can now prevent. But the truth is that while I do not suffer with active cancer, I suffer with secondary issues. And I've made a testament that my journey does not have to be someone else's journey. Next slide. Cervical cancer in 2001, when I was diagnosed at 25, wasn't being talked about. It wasn't on TV shows. It wasn't in movies. There were no panels being held like this. I didn't know anything. And I thought as a television producer, I was in the know, but I didn't know anything about cervical cancer and nothing about those three letters, HPV, otherwise known as the human papillomavirus. Next slide. You know, this is embarrassing sometimes to say, but the more people I talk to, I know I'm not alone. I didn't know exactly where my cervix was. I didn't know exactly what my cervix was for. I'm a college graduate. I love knowing random facts, but the truth was I didn't know a lot about this. So when I was diagnosed with cervical cancer, I wanted to know every single thing that I could about what was happening to me, what was happening to my body, and why no one was talking about it. And as Congressman Shriver said earlier, people don't want to talk about it. There's a stigma. I'm glad that we're all having these conversations and we're moving the needle. I didn't know how important screening was. And as a broadcast producer, my screening fell through the cracks because sometimes I didn't have health insurance. Now I know differently. I know the importance of it and I know how vital vaccines are to also eliminate cervical cancer. We have the tools in our toolbox. We have great screening and vaccines to eliminate HPV related cancers. Next slide. Next slide. My why became the organization that I created. I needed something that could hold my hand when I thought dealing with the everyday existence of a cancer that was so stigmatized was too much. I also needed a place to vent and share my frustrations, but I also wanted to know why no one was talking about this. So I created what I wish I had, and that organization is Survivor, now a global movement to get people talking, sharing their stories. And I am most proud of those who have stood and said, I have an HPV cancer, and I want you to know how this cancer impacted me. Because unfortunately, some people think that this cancer is an easy cancer. Next slide. When you share your story, you have to share your stories in safe places. I'm glad that this place that we're sharing our stories today is a safe place. When you share stories like this, you have to share what happened to you, how it made you feel, how it, it impacted you, what you want people to know. And what I want you all to know today is that no one has to die of cervical cancer. No one has to die of HPV-related cancers. 
we can stop this. Next slide. I've shared my story across the world, but what matters most is that I'm here to share my story and inspire others to share theirs and to listen. We have the science, but we need the stories. We need to hear the stories of those who have been diagnosed with HPV related cancers. When you hear from Jason, Superman HPV himself, you'll see that these cancers are not easy, but we are fortunate that we came out on the other side. Next slide. Connecting the dots is understanding that we know what we need to do. We just have to do it. We need the funding. We have the tools and we have to make sure the infrastructure is there. We have this incredible panel and people on the ground doing this work. The time is now. Next slide. Because we can eliminate cervical cancer and HPV related cancers. Next slide. We do these through our storytelling at our survivor schools and we wanna support your data. Next slide. Dr. Noel Brewer said that we gave the data, but we didn't tell the story. That's what patient stories do. We bring the data to life. Next slide. We do these through our partners and purpose. Many of you who are here today and we're so thankful for you. Next slide. And we do it by empowering others. These are just a few of the amazing women on our survivor network around the world who are bravely sharing their stories. Next slide. But we also do this by remembering. And today while I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about Erica. I'm thinking about Laura. I'm thinking about Holly. I am thinking about Kat who died three years ago today. I am thinking about Kratissa. I am thinking about each one of these women and so many more who are no longer with us. Let's stop this now while we can. Next slide. I have the um, wonderful honor of introducing Dr. Shoba Christian, who has been working tirelessly to prevent HPV related cancers. She is the founder and president of the Global Initiative Against HPV and Cervical Cancer. Thank you, Dr. Shoba, for all you do, not only for our patients, but all the people that you are protecting from future HPV related cancers. Thank you, Tamika, for your inspiring and powerful um, message as always. Good afternoon, members of Congress and staff. It is my honor to be able to speak to you during the US versus HPV Prevention Week and to set the stage for why we as a society should prioritize to invest in preventing six different types of cancers caused by a common virus called the human papilloma virus or HPV, which is not only a public health problem, but it also imposes a huge economic burden on our society, not to mention the physical, the financial, and the emotional toll that it takes on our patients, like we just heard. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, I have nothing to disclose. Next slide, please. So what is HPV? HPV is a virus. It's not HIV. HPV is a common virus. In fact, 80 to 90% in the general population but have had it at some point in their lives. It's an equal opportunity virus, which means anyone can get it. And there are many types of HPV, but the most common types that cause cancers are type 16 and 18. So where do we find HPV? Well, it's a virus, so it's everywhere. And it's been around for centuries. So how does one get it? Well, it can spread skin to skin and mucous membranes and it can transmit itself both non-sexually and also sexually, which is the more common route. But the scary part is that it can remain dormant in a person for years and then transmit itself from one person to another without any symptoms to cause disease at a later stage. So who gets HPV? 75% of the infections are caught between the ages of 15 and 25 years of age. And do all HPV infections, which is so common, cause cancer? Well, there's a silver lining here. Over 90% of HPV infections, they clear up on their own. But it is that 10% that persists may progress to cancer. 
And when does this uh, persist? Well, usually when a person has a weakened immune system and HIV causes a weakened immune system, even stress causes a weakened immune system. And who doesn't have stress these days, right? And why are we talking about it? Because we have solutions today. Over 90% of all HPV cancers in all genders can be prevented by a safe, effective HPV vaccine. And cervical cancer, which is also caused by HPV, is almost 100% preventable through vaccination, safe, simple, effective, and inexpensive screening and early treatment. Next slide, please. So here is a snapshot of the disease burden of HPV in the United States. It causes cervical cancer, vaginal cancer, vulval cancer, penile cancer, anal cancer, where women are twice as more affected as men, and oropharyngeal or head and neck cancers, where men are four to five times more affected than women. So men, beware. And overall, there, and the sad part really is that these HPV cancers occur at a relatively young age. For example, cervical cancer peaks itself between the ages of 35 and 44, and head and neck cancers in their 50s. And overall, as you can see, there are about 37,000 new HPV cancers that are diagnosed every year in the United States, in addition to non-cancerous uh, uh, diseases like genital warts, which affects about 350,000 people per year, and recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, or RRP, where small polyps grow in the throats of infants and young adults requiring repeated surgeries. Next slide, please. And within this disease burden lies racial and ethnic disparities. For example, in cervical cancer, Black, Hispanic, and American Indian women are more likely to be diagnosed and die of cervical cancer than their white counterparts. Why? Because of poor knowledge, poor access, poor follow-up, which is really a huge uh, global problem itself. Next slide, please. So how do we bridge this gap? Well, we can today with advances in modern technology. The HPV vaccine is a game changer. It's an anti-cancer vaccine, but because it prevents, the best time to give it is between the ages of nine to 12 years of age and everyone before a person is exposed to the virus or when there's least exposure to the virus to prevent a disease or a cancer later in life. But for those of us who have crossed this ideal age when the vaccination is most effective, one of the best ways to protect ourselves from cervical cancer is through screening. In fact, the CDC estimates that over 50% of those women who are diagnosed with cervical cancer in the United States are those who have never been screened or underscreened. And of the 14,000 cases of cervical cancer that occur every year in the US, nearly one third die an unnecessary death from this preventable disease. And that is why the National Cancer Institute's last mile initiative works to achieve equity through self-collection, which means women can now collect samples themselves. And if they're in rural areas, these tests can be run in mobile health units and they can even be treated for precancers in these mobile health units. And through telehealth, we can send reminders for vaccination, screening, follow-up, and even enable task shifting which means healthcare providers in remote areas can reach out to experts for second opinion in larger centers by transmitting images and thereby be able to render care to their marginalized and their um, high-risk patients. Isn't this wonderful? Next slide, please. And I would remiss if we did not acknowledge the US Global Health Assistance Program that has saved millions of lives in HIV AIDS, maternal child health, that survivors of these illnesses are now increasingly dying from cervical cancer. So it is essential that we are able to integrate cervical cancer prevention uh, services into other women's health and sexual and reproductive health services. Because if we did that, for as an example, in low and middle income countries for cervical cancer, the return on investment can be as high as $26 for every $1 invested. And I'm sure one of my colleagues will be co covering some US statistics too later on in this session. Uh, next slide, please. 
And there's never a more passionate voice for this preventable disease than that of a patient advocates. And with that, I turn over the mic to Jason Mendelson. Thank you. Hi, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, as Shoba said, I'm Jason Mendelson. I'm a survivor of HPV-related tonsil cancer. I am also known as Superman HPV within the head neck cancer advocacy community. Um, just to set the record straight, I do not think of myself as a superhero. My friends called me Superman during chemo and radiation, stating that I was tough like Superman. And so I adopted the name. I thought it was a little edgy because when I was diagnosed in 2014, it was a diagnosis I had literally never heard of. So I wanted to draw attention to the, to the diagnosis. Because I only have a few minutes, I want to start with this as well. I made video a few weeks into treatment of chemo and radiation. I made videos to our three kids saying goodbye. At the time, my boy girl twins were 12 and our son was six and my videos went something like this. One day you're gonna get married. I'm not going to be there. This is what's important. And I made those videos over and over and over again, truly believing that this was the last thing my kids ever heard from me that I wanted it to be perfect. And so I'm committed to sharing my story to protect and prevent other parents from ever having to make similar videos to their kids. And that's why I speak um, at such a high level regarding the importance of the HPV vaccine. As well, I want you to know that if this vaccine would have been around when, when I was a young boy, I know my parents would have given it to me and I would have likely never been diagnosed with this cancer. Next slide, please. One of the most common questions I get asked is, is this what Michael Douglas had? They always want to know if this was the same diagnosis. I always tell people it's the one thing he and I haven't common outside of our love for Catherine Zeta-Jones. There's just a little bit of humor. Next slide, please. When I was first diagnosed and went public, people asked my wife, why isn't he embarrassed? Why isn't he ashamed to go public with an HPV cancer diagnosis? And quite honestly, I think it's, it's just a, a horrible thing that anyone should ever feel embarrassed or ashamed to be diagnosed with cancer. Um, it should not be something that people need to hide in the shadows with. I did my homework and I realized that three out of four adults by 30 had the virus, 62% of freshmen in college, and that men between the ages of 40 and 60 are the most highly diagnosed decades after being exposed. They believed that I was exposed to the virus while in college and that the virus lay dormant in the crypts of my throat for decades. On a side note, in the last 48 months, tongue, throat, and tonsil cancer caused by HPV has surpassed cervical cancer and become an epidemic among men between 40 and 60. Also affecting women, obviously. Next slide, please. So who is Superman? Where did I come from? And be very brief on this, but to tell you, when I was diagnosed at 44, my wife and I had been married 17 years. Our boy-girl twins were 12. Our son was six. We were busy like any other busy couple. I was working 50 to 70 hours a week, traveling all over the country. And the day I was taking a financial exam, put my hand on my face to ponder a question, moved my hand down to my neck and felt a small bump. And that bump had never been there before. Back then I had hair and no beard. I shaved my head and grew a beard during COVID. Um, and I remember thinking, I don't have time to think about dying right now. Quite honestly, I passed the test, showed my father, who's a physician, my neck. And he said, let's call the ear, nose and throat doctor, which we did. He said, you don't smoke, you don't drink heavily. Come see me in a few weeks. I went to see him on Monday. They put me on 10 days of antibiotics and steroids and said, in the slight chance that it doesn't go away, we're immediately going to schedule you for a needle biopsy and CAT scan. I lived my life. Nothing changed. I came back from a conference on a Wednesday evening, Thursday CAT scan, Friday needle biopsy. Monday found out I had stage four HPV-related tonsil cancer. It was devastating. Absolutely devastating. Next slide, please. As I said earlier, a few weeks into treatment, and this is my family, I um, made videos to my kids saying goodbye and, and they were heart-wrenching. I'm committed so no other you know, parent has to do make a similar video to their kids. Next slide, please. Several weeks into treatment, and what you're looking at here is treatment. This is me, my head clipped onto a table. Radiation to the throat is brutal. 
chemo is unpleasant because you feel nauseous, but radiation is brutal. It's like burns on top of burns on top of burns. And I had open sores in my mouth. I had saliva so thick I couldn't swallow it. I was gagging and choking 40 to 60 times a day. And it was brutal. It felt like someone had broken a glass and shoved the shards of glass into my throat. And it was not pleasant. And again, hence the reason the importance of the HPV vaccine to protect and prevent people um, from ever having to go through this. Next slide, please. This is a poem my daughter made for me. I, I wear the cufflinks every time I speak. Um, I'm gonna get choked up, but it says, my hero, my dad, he is Superman. He is always strong. He is always determined. He is always sweet. He is always loving. He is always funny. He is a survivor. Um, it, I love the, the poem, but the truth is that no child should ever have to make a video like that, or a video, excuse me, a poem like that um, to any of their parents, especially when there is a an HPV vaccine that can protect their parents from preventable cancer. I will leave you with this thought. We I appreciate you listening to me today. I do a ton of cancer advocacy work. Cancer story has been shared in over 100 countries. I serve on the board of the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance seven years and the HPV Cancers Alliance. And you in the room have the ability to stress the importance of the HPV vaccine to protect and prevent families just like mine from ever having to deal with the hell that my family had to deal with back in 2014 and since. And so I re really appreciate your time and thank you. It's my pleasure to be able to um, present Heather Brandt our next speaker, who does a tremendous amount of work with, she is, you'll see her soon as the blonde scientist, but she is um, with St. Jude and she's crushing it there and helping us all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, for sharing your powerful story. Uh, it's always inspiring to me and reminds me about why I'm so committed to doing this work. I am Heather Brandt. I direct the HPV Cancer Prevention Program at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. You're gonna hear some things from me here in my time that uh, things that have already been said that I want to reinforce and also add some new information about HPV vaccination and HPV cancers here in the United States. Next slide, please. So most cancers caused by HPV are almost entirely preventable. Every year in the United States, as we heard, about 40,000 people are diagnosed with a cancer caused by HPV infection. And although cervical cancer may be the most well-known of cancers caused by HPV, it's just the tip of the iceberg. HPV vaccination could prevent more than 90% of cancers caused by HPV from ever developing. It's also important to note that hundreds of thousands of people with a cervix are diagnosed with precancers of the cervix each year. And there are estimated to be more than half a million cases of genital warts, plus thousands of cases of RRP, as we heard. And recent estimates indicate HPV costs $9 billion each year in the United States. So HPV is costly in terms of dollars and cents, and also people. Every data point we share today represents a person who's known and loved and mattered, just like the powerful stories we heard from Tamika and Jason. So HPV vaccination offers us awesome cancer and disease prevention potential. Next slide. The most recently available data for HPV cancers in the United States are from 2020. And there's a lot of regional variability in the incidence of HPV cancers. And HPV cancer incidence rates for the 12 highest states are shown here in the table. Oral pharyngeal cancers, as we've heard, have surpassed cervical cancer as the most common type of HPV cancers. And this change happened a few years ago. And about 83% of those HPV-associated oral pharyngeal cancer cases are diagnosed among men. So HPV vaccination is for everyone. And unlike for cervical cancer screening, we do not have a recommended approach for screening for oral pharyngeal cancers. And so this is something that vaccination can really contribute to helping to prevent down the road. Next slide. Um, so just in sum, 
a lot of people are affected by HPV in the United States each year. And HPV vaccination is for everyone because everyone is affected by HPV. And it has the possibility of preventing 90% of HPV cancers. Next slide. So speaking of HPV vaccination, I want to transition to HPV vaccination in the United States, where this vaccine has been recommended routinely since 2006. And HPV vaccine is a preventive vaccine. So this means it works best to provide full, complete protection when it's given to someone, whether by choice or force, they're engaged in behaviors that could result in transmission. But HPV vaccination may be appropriate across the lifespan, and even those who weren't vaccinated on time may still benefit. Cancer takes years, even decades, to develop after a person gets HPV, and the CDC recommends HPV vaccination at ages 9 through 12 to prevent HPV infections that may lead to these cancers in adulthood. On-time HPV vaccination is completion of the HPV vaccination series by the 13th birthday. Day. Next slide, please. So here's how HPV vaccination coverage compares with other adolescent vaccinations. Coverage for all vaccines um, have increased over time, but there's still this sizable coverage gap between HPV vaccination coverage and coverage for Tdap or whooping cough and meningitis vaccines for this exact same age group. These are missed opportunities to protect kids today from cancers they could develop in adulthood. Next slide. In some part of the parts of the United States, we're doing really well and others not so well. And so shown here is HPV vaccination initiation by state. There's again wide variation in coverage across the country, ranging from the lowest in Mississippi to the highest in Rhode Island. Next slide. And this slide here shows state level coverage for HPV vaccination series completion or HPV vaccination up to date. In the United states, we are still following the schedule as I showed earlier, two doses through age 14, three doses thereafter, and three doses for anyone who's immunocompromised. And in terms of the nation's Healthy People 2030 goal, we fall short nationally, but some states like Rhode Island have achieved the national goal. And so coverage again ranges from lowest in Mississippi to highest in Rhode Island. You may notice a similar coverage pattern for HPV uh, up to date as with HPV vaccination initiation. And if I were to position the map of HPV cancers and HPV vaccination side by side, you would see a concerning trend where areas of our country where we have the highest HPV cancer rates are the same areas with the lowest HPV vaccination coverage. So there certainly is work to do. Next slide. Even with suboptimal HPV vaccination coverage, it's important to emphasize how well this vaccine has worked to prevent HPV cancers, precancers, and other HPV diseases. And surveillance data in the United States have shown clear reduction in HPV infections. Next slide. We know HPV vaccination works to prevent actual cases of cancer based on several studies published in the last few years and even a study in Scotland that was again released just here in the last few days. Studies in these other countries corroborate what we've been observing in the United States. HPV vaccination works to prevent cancers. Next slide. So HPV is common. Almost everyone's going to have one of these infections in their lifetime. We don't know who gets this infection is going to move to precancer or cancer. That's why let's take out the guesswork. HPV vaccination prevents 90% if we can get kids vaccinated on time. And HPV vaccination is for everyone. And elimination of HPV cancers beginning with cervical cancer is possible in the United States through HPV vaccination, cervical cancer screening, and timely treatment. 
Next slide, please. So everyone plays a role in preventing HPV cancers. Get vaccinated if you're of age. Have your children vaccinated if they're eligible. Encourage others to get vaccinated. And share the facts. HPV can cause deadly cancers. HPV vaccination prevents six types of cancer. HPV vaccination is safe it works and it gives long lasting protection and support the Prevent HPV Cancers Act. This is an important step forward in our nation's path to elimination. Thank you. And now it's my honor to pass the mic to Dr. Katherine Kundrad, who's the Senior Advisor for the Cancer Moonshot Policy Coordination Activities. Katherine? Thank you so much, Dr. Brandt. As Heather noted, my name is Katherine Coonrod, and I serve as Senior Advisor for Cancer Moonshot Policy Coordination in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP. OSTP is the home for the Biden Cancer Moonshot, and its mission includes strengthening and advancing American science and technology, working with federal departments and agencies, and with Congress to create bold visions, wise policies, and effective, equitable programs engaging with external partners, and ensuring equity, inclusion, and integrity in all aspects of science and technology. In 2016, then Vice President Biden launched the Cancer Moonshot with the mission to accelerate the rate of progress against cancer. Nearly two years ago now, the President and First Lady reignited the Biden Cancer Moonshot to mobilize a national effort to end cancer as we know it. By bringing together the federal government healthcare providers, researchers, patients, caregivers, advocates, and the public and private sectors together, the Biden Cancer Moonshot is dramatically accelerating progress to end cancer as we know it. Cancer touches every American in some way and is still the second leading cause of death in America. That's why accelerating progress against cancer is a central pillar of President Biden's unity agenda, issues we can all get behind to deliver for the American people. We are mobilizing effort toward achieving two clear goals set by the President and First Lady. The first goal is to reduce the death rate from cancer by at least 50% over the next 25 years, which translates to preventing more than 4 million cancer deaths by 2047. And the second is to improve the experience of people who are touched by cancer. The President set up the first ever cancer cabinet to mobilize the federal government and called on individuals, healthcare providers, and leaders across sectors to step up and take action in five key priority areas. First, make sure everyone has access to cancer screening so more Americans can catch cancer early when outcomes are best. Second, understand and prevent exposures to toxic substances like forever chemicals and air pollution. Third, prevent more cancers before they start by reducing tobacco use, making sure everyone has access to healthy food, and of special interest today, getting more people vaccinated against HPV, which as we all know, causes several types of cancer. Fourth, deliver the latest cancer innovations to patients and communities so that all families benefit from breakthrough advances to prevent, detect, treat, and survive cancer. And fifth, support and center patients and caregivers by helping them navigate the many decisions associated with a diagnosis, providing patients easy access to their health information and driving action to lower drug costs. Within each of these priority actions, the Biden Cancer Moonshot is working to deliver new ways to prevent, detect, and treat cancer and to ensure that the tools we have and those we develop along the way equitably reach all Americans. This is our approach too to ending cervical cancer and other HPV-related cancers as we know them. Focusing on cervical cancer, we know this cancer is preventable with HPV vaccination and access to early detection and preventive treatment. However, cervical cancer remains the second leading cause of cancer death in women aged 20 to 39 years. As published by the American Cancer Society this month, cervical cancer incidence has increased by 1 to 2% annually during 2015 to 2019 among people aged 30 to 44. Due to the recent uptick in cases, cervical cancer has moved up to become the third most common cancer death among young women. And these cases are disproportionately faced by low-income women, women of color, and LGBTQ plus individuals. To end HPV-related cancers as we know them, the Biden Cancer Moonshot is working to reduce HPV-driven cancers through increased vaccination, 
reduce disparities in cervical cancer screening access, including by bringing screening closer to communities, support the development of less invasive cancer screening tools and evidence around screening for additional HPV-related cancers, and drive innovation to improve patient outcomes. Toward these goals, the Cancer Cabinet has stepped up and made bold commitments over the past two years. Some of these include the following. The Department of Health and Human Services committed to accelerating efforts to nearly eliminate cervical cancer through screening and HPV vaccination. The U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, and the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, continue to integrate cervical cancer screening and treatment of precancer for HIV-positive women under the Go Further initiative. The Biden Cancer Moonshot announced its first ever cohort of Cancer Moonshot Scholars, a program launched by President Biden through the National Cancer Institute to support early career researchers and help build a cancer research workforce that better represents the diversity of America. One of the scholars, Dr. Leah Pinder of the University of Cincinnati is conducting a randomized clinical trial to evaluate the safety and acceptability of a novel therapy for improving cervical cancer prevention options in low resource settings. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention invested $15 million to prevent and detect HPV-related cancers and finally, the president worked with Democrats and Republicans in Congress to launch and fund the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, or ARPA-H, to fundamentally transform how we prevent, detect, and treat cancer and other diseases. The private and nonprofit sectors have stepped up to end cervical cancer as we know it, domestically and globally too. The American Cancer Society launched the National Roundtable on Cervical Cancer in response to the reignited Biden Cancer Moonshot. Japigo, in partnership with Roche Group, initiated a project in India focused on integrated screening for breast and cervical cancer at the primary healthcare level with linkage to diagnosis and management care. BD and the Ministry of Health Kenya are launching a pilot for scale oncology partnership aimed at providing end-to-end -end cervical cancer screening within the public sector. Electa Foundation, in collaboration with the Rwanda Ministry of Health, the Rwanda Biomedical Center, Clinton Health Access Initiative, and the Society for Family Health launched a pilot campaign to rapid test women in rural villages for HPV. And Moffitt Cancer, Cancer Center, together with the University of Ghana, announced a total of over $1.3 million over the next five years to train up to 100 fellows and junior faculty and to embed a sustainable cancer research training program at the school. The Biden Cancer Moonshot builds on decades of bipartisan support, public health progress, and scientific advances around cancer. As a result, we have made substantial progress to lower the cancer death rate, which is down 33% since its peak in 1991. So much of this progress is due to better prevention and better early detection. In order to build on this progress to prevent more than 4 million cancer deaths by 2047 and to improve the experiences of patients, families, and caregivers facing cancer, we need to continue to equitably improve access to the tools and methods we know work today. And we need to continue to support innovation to bring these tools closer to people in their own communities in ways that work for more diverse populations who bear disproportionate burdens of cancer. We would love to hear your ideas on how the Cancer Moonshot can improve HPV-related cancer prevention and control in your work and communities. You can share your ideas and, uh, for action and your stories at whitehouse.gov slash cancer moonshot. Again, that's whitehouse.gov slash cancer moonshot. It will take all of us in all communities and sectors to end HPV-related cancers as we know them. And we want to hear your experiences and your thoughts on the policies, programs, and priorities to get us there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for your wonderfully thoughtful and incredibly powerful presentations. We'll now open up the forum for questions from our Q&A chat box. And the first question is, um, how do we educate providers and others in the healthcare space, like school nurses, to increase vaccination uptake, especially among children? So who on our panel would like to answer? My simple answer is speak with them. 
I mean, I'm sure there's a more sophisticated answer by the other members of the panel, but my answer would be go out of your comfort zone and go speak to the people in charge to make it happen. I was just going to add that uh, the recently there have been some examples of success and partnerships with school nurses through the School Nurse Association, whether that's nationally or within state level chapters. And I think Jason hit on it. You don't know until you don't start having those conversations with uh, people making decisions in schools. You will find allies and advocates among parents and caregivers uh, through that process and also can reach a very captive audience. Um, there have been several examples of this, um, including in South Carolina recently, where they've partnered with large metropolitan school districts to be able to deliver vaccination information and then bring mobile units to bring vaccines to the schools, uh, which is, uh, it's not a, a necessarily a friendly environment for that type of partnership and collaboration, but through those conversations, discussions, and partner-driven efforts, they were able to have success. So I do think it all starts with asking and then taking advantage of successful models as examples. And if I may add, um, with all the education that is required, also we have seen within the United States that states which have school requirements are doing much better than those who don't. So that might be also an avenue to pursue to be able to increase the uptake of uh, HPV vaccination. Absolutely. Thank you. Next question also open to all panelists. Where do we stand in the US in moving to a one dose schedule for HPV vaccination? Uh, I can answer that. As you know, the one dose schedule has been uh, openly um, accepted by many parts of the world, including the UK and Australia. Uh, so we have had several studies uh, coming out of Kenya called the Kenshi study. There is actually another study going on in Costa Rica. And I know that the ACIP is really looking at it carefully um, to see you know, whether it would be advisable to accept the one dose uh, vaccine in the US. Okay, I think we'll probably have time for one more question. Um, what is the coverage landscape for the HPV vaccine? Is it covered for both children and adults? So most major insurers are going to fully cover the cost of HPV vaccination through the routine recommended age of 26. And in some areas, you'll find that major insurers cover fully from ages 27 to 45. In non-expansion states, Medicaid non-expansion states, there still are a lot of coverage gaps for publicly insured adults. However, for children, so 18 and younger, so that nine to 18 year old age range through the Vaccines for Children's program, an incredibly successful federal program. Uh, vaccinations, including HPV as a routinely recommended vaccine should be widely available and accessible. There also are state title funds, uh, federal 317 and other vaccination programs within states. And so that nine to 18 year old age group should have no issues um, accessing coverage for uh, HPV vaccines. It is the adult population where we continue to see gaps and particularly see gaps, um, but it is possible to overcome those gaps. I know I said some things about Mississippi being lowest, which is true. I also want to give them a shout out. Their state Medicaid program recently added a new title and will be covering adult HPV vaccination through age 45 for publicly insured adults. So it is possible in non-Medicaid expansion states for states to make decisions to enhance coverage and access. Thank you. And thank you all for attending our important briefing today. We've really seen the power of prevention and the impact vaccination can have on our health. If you are interested in learning more, please check out the chat box for ways to get in touch. As it says, all of us really play a role and we are all part of the change we wanna see. So please join us and continue to participate in efforts to amplify and destigmatize the conversation about HPV, support screening, advance timely care, normalize vaccination. Let's elevate the voices of survivors and embrace their experiences. Again, we'd really like to thank you all for joining us here today and our amazing and inspiring speakers, Congresswomen Castor, Letlow and Schreier, and again, Mark for their generous support. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.